think you're insurable. Excellent. And I think your uh, sure. deductible would be very, very low indeed. <laughs> That's okay, fine. Senator Small has some questions. You th can you hear me, Senator Small? from uh, behind the Iron Curtain here. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Good evening. Sorry? Um, I'll start, if I can, <laughs> with a couple of... Okay, far, far off, Senator Small, as quickly as you can. Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yes. No. Okay, yeah, rip up. Um, so, in response to um, some questions from uh, my colleague, Senator Brockman, uh, in the June estimates of last year, um, APRA indicated a review of the sole purpose test uh, would follow once the Your Future, Your Super reforms uh, had passed. Um, and, and I guess many industry participants I talk to are sort of asking why a 21-year-old piece of guidance has yet to be updated. Can you offer any guidance on how that review is going and what the timeline looks like? So who'd like to... Thanks, well, I think that I missed the first, the date line. Sorry, Senator Small, but I think it might have pre preceded my joining up. So I might ask Ms. Smith to answer the question, if you don't mind. Thank you. And just for the record, Suzanne Smith, Executive Director of Superannuation at APRA. So thanks for the question. Um, in relation to the sole purpose test, also since that time with the Your Future, Your Super reforms, we've had the introduction of the best financial interest duty, which is an important duty which um, you know extends the onus onto trustees to act in the best financial interests of members and also reverses the onus of proof. What we're looking at doing is um, looking at all of our standards and guidance in relation to what the introduction of the best financial interest duty means. And we're in the process of doing that. So with the sole purpose test and the best financial interest duty, that will be wrapped up in the review, which we're currently undertaking to ensure that the standards and guidance that we have in place um, is best incorporating these higher standards and requirements. So over the course of the next um, over the course of the next few months into 2022, we're reviewing that, that review will incorporate the sole purpose test and best financial interest duty. And so, would it be fair to expect that to be finalised by say mid year, or uh, I wouldn't. I haven't. I, I don't know that I can commit to a time frame, but I I know that we're in the process of looking at all of the the guidance that um, we have in the concept in the context of the best financial interest duty. So I would hope that it would have, if it's not completed, it'd be well in train. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, well, Senator. Then. We're also looking at the way that um, testing with trustees, the way that they're approaching the change to best financial interest duty. And with the benefit of the reverse burden of proof, we're being very active in asking them to justify, you know, how they approach that new duty. So anything that we can, you know, any changes to guidance or, or standards will be informed by, you know, those real life interactions with the entities that we supervise. Yeah, thanks for that, um, uh, Ms. Cole. And I think that's getting to the crux of it. That's what industry really needs. So. There's one other issue I um, touched on last estimates as well, um, and that's uh, the IDII market. And as I understand it, Tranche 3 is scheduled to commence on 1 October of this year, um, and it requires life insurance um, uh, underwriters to provide um, contract renewal every five years, subject to policy terms and conditions that apply at that time. Um, so what, if any, disadvantages uh, could this result for consumers, um, I guess, particularly looking at things like reduced terms, increased costs, or uh, even in extreme cases, uh, the total loss of cover. So I will respond on that. It follows on from the questions from uh, Mr. McDonald. Um, we are aware of the um, the implications and 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 pros and cons of moving to the five-year policy contract term. Um, there are questions of providing certainty and stability um, for policyholders as well as insurers um, versus some of the issues that you referred to, which is continuing access to cover and the need to re-underwrite and the like. They're complex things to balance, 
when we introduced the IDII measures, we felt that there was a need to make significant changes in the um, RDII market to address the underlying losses and um, poor outcomes for policyholders that were occurring. The, the five-year contract term was one of a set of measures. Um, it's the only one that remains to be put in place. And we did defer it because of the feedback we had from industry about some of the challenges and complexities. We've had further engagement up through the Financial Services Council and with individual insurers over the last couple of months. And we are still discussing with them those challenges and, and the, the sort of the, the pros and cons, if you like, of that measure. And um, we will need to communicate our response to industry as to um, proceeding or otherwise with that particular provision in the coming months. Yeah. Do you have, um, I guess, a firm deadline in time by which you would communicate that to industry? I guess, given obviously it's, it's quite obviously profoundly important, I guess, to those working in that space. We don't have a firm timeline, but we are aware of the um, importance and the urgency. It is actively under discussion and consideration within APRA, and we would hope to be uh, communicating. I'd like to commit to by the end of March, um, but but you know there are no guarantees on that. But that's that's the goal we're working towards is to make a decision and communicate by March as to whether we're proceeding with that um, requirement or not. Okay, thanks very much, Ms. Rail, and thank you, Chair.